If you are expecting a short video on the top 50 or top 100 items you should have in your bug out bag, but with no rationale on why you will need such items, then sorry to disappoint you. I don't do quick and easy just for the sake of quick and easy. Like any surgeon will tell you, and I know a very good one who is also a good friend, certain things have to be done with clinical precision or not done at all. Your bug out bag is a life-saving piece of equipment, and likewise, every item you pack inside has an equally important life-saving purpose. It is therefore important that I explain why you will need to have certain items, rather than just rattle off a list to you. Also, and this is very important, is that as each of your family member packs their individual bag, they will also appreciate why they have what they have in their bag. Whether they watch this video themselves or whether you explain it to them, the understanding of the purpose and value of the bug out bag then becomes entrenched and a part of their life. Wow. Now you have your perfect bug out bag. It matches your torso length. It has all the bells and whistles, it is well designed, robust, and most certainly a bag that even Rambo or Chuck would be envious of. But what is inside the bag? Or what do you intend to pack inside? Will whatever is inside, give you that 72 hour survival edge? Will it take care of the rules of three? Picture the scenario. You have no option but to bug out. You calmly tell your family to grab their well chosen bug out bags. With one last look at what you are leaving behind, you all then hurriedly, with no panic, make your way to the exit point. Now picture this. As you and your family reach the exit point, or maybe just past the exit point, you all drop to your knees, then on your backs, thrashing about like fish out of water, grabbing your throats, holding your chests, a few minutes later you are all. Well, you get the picture. The first consideration of what to pack in your bug out bag, is the fact that once that bag goes on your back, you will be evacuating from one point to another point. This means that you will probably be on your feet and walking through an atmosphere of sorts. Considering that evacuation or bugging out is usually when the normal becomes abnormal, there is then the likelihood that the atmosphere around you may contain contaminant particles which may have an adverse impact on your breathing ability as you exit, or as you make your way beyond the exit point. Therefore, in terms of rule 2, 3 minutes without air, the first things you should pack into an easily accessible compartment of your bug out bag will be those items that protect your respiratory organs and ability to continue to breathe during an exit and beyond that exit. These items will include prescribed medication for any medically diagnosed chronic conditions such as respiratory problems, hypertension, or any other medical issues that may cause you to falter or fail during the bug out phase. For instance, if you use an asthma inhaler or have some form of airborne allergy, you should, as a minimum, have at least one spare inhaler and anti-allergy meds packed in your bag already. Likewise, if you have high blood pressure, you should have spare meds in your bag in the event you need to maintain your blood pressure before, during, and after a bug out. This will be the same for any other prescription medication that would be vital to keep your organs functioning during and beyond a bug out. Inhalation of harmful and toxic substances in the air is considered the predominant route of infection since we must breathe to live. There is that possibility that you will have to protect your respiratory organs as you bug out or beyond the bug out. Once a toxic substance or airborne disease enters your respiratory tract, it will affect your respiratory system and at times your entire body. Here your choice of what to pack as a quick grab item will range from one or more items. The first is what is referred to as an emergency respirator device. These devices are specifically made for situations where you have to escape through an atmosphere that would be immediately dangerous to life or health, or an IDLH environment, as it is referred to. These emergency respirator devices have a self-contained supply of oxygen that will allow the user to breathe clean oxygen either through an actuator or piped mask as they evacuate through contaminated or smoke-filled atmospheres. Other than the weight of the respirator itself, and because oxygen is weightless, an emergency respirator device will not add any significant weight to your bag, but, it will certainly add to your life safety index. Then, whether you have an emergency respirator device or not, there is the delicate issue of face masks. Face masks have been given an unfortunate bad rap recently, you obviously know why. However, any person that uses them, that is, the real face masks, in certain working environments that contain contaminant type atmospheres, will attest to their value. A few good disposable face masks, and certainly not a piece of cloth or curtain voil, will be an invaluable tool for you to have in your bag. Filtering face piece particle masks, or FFP masks, as they are known, or the N-type masks have become quite famous, and also rather infamous in the last few years. But here's what you need to know. 
not all masks are equal. Each country has their own certification standard for disposable face masks. These standards range from the NIOSH standard in the US, the EN standards in the EU, the GB and YY standards in China, the ASNZ standards in Australia, the KMOEL standards in Korea, and the JMHLW standards in Japan. These face pieces are then homologated for use in another country against their own respective standard, that is, if they have such a standard. The problem is that no one tells you exactly what the masks are certified for, unless you use a magnifying glass to read the fine print on the packaging. The bigger problem is that even those who regulate the use of face masks in an environment, do not even know the difference between a certified face mask and a piece of cloth. We have heard the term, N95, so much that many people consider themselves experts on everything just by wearing this N95 mask. In the US, face masks are certified against the NIOSH standard. In terms of the certification of this mask, N just indicates that the mask filter is not resistant to oil, meaning that if oil particles are present in the air, the mask should not be worn. There are also the P and R series filters, where the logic is that you can use any one of the N, P or R type, if no oil particles are present in the air. However, where oil particles are indeed present, you can only use the R type for once off use, or the P type for multiple uses. The 95 means that the filter efficiency of the mask is rated to capture 95% of tiny, non oil based, 0.3 micron sized airborne particles before they enter your respiratory system. In terms of the NIOSH standard, Filter efficiency is decided on three levels, that is, 95%, 99% or 99.97%. Conversely, this means that in the case of the N95 mask, that there is a probable 5% leakage of contaminated air through the filter, or that the higher the mask filter efficiency, the lower the filter leak through percentage. The European standard is essentially the same as the US standard, but, European masks are rated as FFR, which means filtering face piece respirators. These are named FFP1, FFP2, and FFP3. In terms of their efficiency ratings, FFP1 meets a minimum filtration of 80%, FFP2 meets 94%, and FFP3 meets 99%. It is then reasonable to accept that the FFP2 mask is equivalent to the N95 mask. Subsequently, a Chinese mask rated as KN95, and other masks tested and rated as, either ASNZP2, or Korea First Class, and Japan DSFFR, are also equivalent to the N95 mask. However, when it comes to airborne diseases, most experts will usually recommend the FFP3, N100 rated or other equivalent to these masks rather than a FFP2 or N95 mask. What you buy at a typical hardware store is probably the FFP1 mask, which is only good for DIY applications such as sanding and drilling, and for areas where there are low levels of dust in the air. If you are packing the FFP or N-rated face mask, go for the top-rated one. Just when you think you have had enough information about face masks, there are also design elements that some masks will offer and which distinguishes them from others. These will be characteristics like a valved or unvalved mask, where an unvalved mask has its filtration system built into the mask fabric itself, and, where on a valve mask there is a small valve on the face piece that allows air to be exhaled quicker, so as to make it less stuffy than an unvalved mask. Then there is also a choice between folded and molded masks. A folded mask may be easy to carry or hide in your pocket, but, it sometimes does not form a good seal when unfolded and worn. Molded masks are designed for the closest fit possible, but you cannot hide it in your pocket, unless maybe if you play cricket or baseball. There are two other types of air purifying respirators that you could consider. The one is referred to as the half-piece elastomeric respirator. This comes with replaceable filters for particulates, and with cartridges or canisters for gases and vapors. These are attached to the face piece which covers the nose and mouth. The other is the full-piece elastomeric respirator, which comes with a complete face shield and seals around your entire face. The filter and cartridge options are the same as for the half-piece. The advantage of these is that you can filter out particulates, if you have the right filter, and gases and vapors, if you have the right cartridge or canister. The face piece is reusable as it can be decontaminated after use, either with bleach and water or an alcohol disinfectant, the disadvantage is its size, you certainly cannot hide it in your pocket, and you may need replacement parts if a strap or buckle gives up on you. It must be noted that air purifying respirators, and face masks for that matter, are not for oxygen efficient atmospheres. You will in fact die from a lack of oxygen if you think that these devices allow you to waltz into an oxygen-deficient atmosphere like some astronaut. 
In making a choice on whether to pack face masks, an air purifying respirator or emergency respirator device in your bug out bag, just remember that your life will depend on it. It cannot just be a piece of your curtain nor can it be some piece of cloth that you fancy just because of a nice logo. This piece of personal protection not only becomes your 3 second safeguard, but importantly, will ensure that your life safety and survivability index is maintained before, during, and after a bug out. Next will be a first aid kit. Every family member's bug out bag must have their own first aid kit. This is not only for purposes of self-sufficiency, but also for redundancy, and in the event a bug out bag becomes victim to whatever lurks in the dark. You can buy pre-packed first aid kits which have the necessary, most essential first aid items from any pharmacy or tactical shop, or you can put together your own depending on your personal level of first aid skills. If a family member is old enough to carry his or her own bug out bag, then they should at least be taught the basics of what is in their respective first aid kit, and how, and when to use it. Protection of the eyes is normally a forgotten priority, and in a bug out situation, damaging your eyes could threaten your entire mission, or put you in greater danger with every blurred step you take. You will need a good set of polycarbonate safety glasses that has good screening, and, impact protection for the entire lateral region of the eyes. It should also offer good UV protection and with lenses that are anti-scratch and anti-fog. A colored lens with contrast enhancement also helps with nighttime driving, especially when you are facing lights coming at you. Other than your safety glasses enabling you to keep your eyes on the ball, it also offers protection against any liquid splash or blood splash, especially during first aid. Although I have already mentioned having that spare inhaler or spare meds for any chronic medical condition, it is worth mentioning that together with those items, you should, in fact you must, also ensure that you have enough spare prescription medication as well as certain critical over-the-counter meds in your bug out bag. Should you collapse in the immediate area from where you are evacuating because of a diagnosed condition, or maybe perhaps because of the anxiety of bugging out, certain body organs, and possibly even certain orifices want to show you who is boss, this will certainly impact your bug out time and possibly put you at even greater risk, if not dealt with immediately. Therefore, other than normal prescribed meds, ensure that each bug out bag has medication for nausea, diarrhea, indigestion, and similar ailments that may impede the bug out phase and beyond that. Another important item that you should have in your bug out bag is a cat. No, not this one. I am referring to this one. A CAT or Combat Application Tourniquet is a patented device first introduced into the U.S. Army in 2005. It is now standard issue in the U.S. Army and many other military organizations in the world. The CAT is a one-handed tourniquet that has been proven to be 100% effective in completely causing blockage, or occlusion, as it is called in medical terms, of blood flow of an extremity in the event of a traumatic injury with significant blood loss, or hemorrhaging, in medical terms. What am I talking about? Any evacuation, or in this case, bugging out, comes with expected and unexpected high risks. Besides contaminated air, one of the major risks that you could be exposed to, is the probability of a major vascular injury in either your upper or lower extremities. A major vascular injury is where an artery, which carries blood to an extremity or an organ, or a vein, which returns blood to the heart, is punctured, torn, or severed resulting in severe blood loss. If untreated, it could cause someone to bleed out in less than 3 minutes. Remember. You are now operating in abnormal conditions. That major vascular injury could have happened accidentally as you were bugging out. Or worse. It could have been inflicted by an attack, yes, even by that nosy neighbor, as you bugged out. Either way, you or your family member is now bleeding out. Most people will lose consciousness within the first minute if the bleeding has not been stopped or slowed down. The ability to place a tourniquet on yourself or a significant other can be life-saving. The combat application tourniquet or CAT has been designed so that it can be self-applied. You may however need some training in doing so. Having the tourniquet correctly staged and prepared is important. The tourniquet should be immediately available. It should be placed on the outside of your bug out bag, as there will be no time to open zippers and search through compartments once you sustain a serious vascular injury. It is equally important to know how to quickly improvise a tourniquet should you not have a combat application tourniquet close by. Training in the use of a combat application tourniquet usually forms part of a stop the bleed course. I strongly suggest you make time to find one close to you, and that both you, and your family members attend it together. Another skill this course teaches you, is the ability to pack a wound. Any absorbent material may be used but purposely made wound packing gauze is the first choice. 
It does not take up a lot of space and it weighs almost nothing, yet it again could prove life-saving, specifically in neck, armpit, and groin wounds where tourniquets don't work. For now, I have tried to cover the essentials of what you should, or must have in your bug-out bag as it relates to dealing with just the first phase of bugging out. Often, in a time of anxiety or panic, people that need to escape or evacuate from a situation, usually end up dead within the sight of the exit. Granted, some are crushed to death, however, most succumb to vital organ or respiratory failure at the last hurdle. Bugging out is no different. There will be anxiety. There will be stress. There will be blood rush. If you are not equipped to deal with and counteract whatever may impede the first stage of your bug-out phase, you could end up thrashing about like a fish out of water. Or on your bug-out bag as your final resting place. Focus first on items that you would need to mitigate against the 3 minutes without air rule. In my next video, I will go into other items as it relates to the other rules and the rules of 3. Till then. Think prepared, act prepared, be prepared. Subscribe to the South African Prepper. Like and share my videos with your family, friends, and colleagues since we are all in this together. Here you get real information, and fact-based insights and guidance. I don't do opinion or BS. Preparedness is not a hobby. It is a way of life that could save your life.